In June 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, arrived at Christie's on New York's Park Avenue to sell 79 dresses from her incomparable wardrobe. It was the most glamorous auction of the century. Buyers paid from $20,000 to $200,000 for a dress. The money went to Diana's favorite charities. Lot 78, showing here now 10,000, 12,000. Over the years, she's acquired hundreds of gowns, and she's now decided... I adore Princess Diana. I think she is the most beautiful girl in the world. And I wanted to have a part of royalty, if possible. The most glamorous jumble sale of all time. And then this one came along, and I think what really appealed to me was it was a dress that the Princess of Wales have never worn in public. The auction of dresses which belong to Diana, Princess of Wales, has raised more than two million pounds for charity. But what obviously happened, and happened very quickly, was that they did not take into consideration the insanity factor, which, I mean, everyone would got pumped so fast in this thing. The estimates in the catalogue became meaningless. 40,000, 150,000, 160. Historically, it is one of the most important dresses that Diana ever wore. 200,000! Two months later, Diana was dead. In the extraordinary display of grief and mourning that followed, it seemed that the people's princess had become a popular saint. The new owners of her dresses realized they had something very special on their hands. New York, uh, time of the auction, it was incredible, it was a real frenzy. I mean, we did tons of interviews and there was every program was talking about the auction of dresses because I, mean, I don't think anything like that had ever happened before. And Diana turned up and she was absolutely mobbed because there was people pressing up against her, just wanting to touch her, make contact with her. It must have been horrendous. And she hung in there for quite some time because she realized that her presence there was going to make a huge amount of difference, really pushed all the prices up. But I mean, I remember like getting squashed into a corner and these people pushing past me. One of them was Henry Kissinger. And I mean, like, everybody, the whole of American society was there. It was incredible buzz. It's quite interesting just seeing her wardrobe through time. When you went to Christie's, you actually saw how fashion changed. You know, you get into the dynasty-type suits and then into something much simpler. It just kept track with her personality as she became more confident in herself. I mean, in the end, she, didn't, she just didn't need the clothes. She was so stylish, whatever she wore, whether it be just ordinary trousers and a shirt, she just looked fantastic. Elizabeth and David Emmanuel designed lot number 26, inspired by Diaghilev and the Russian ballet. Diana wore it to a James Bond premiere. When my dress was coming up, the anticipation was horrendous and praying, please, God, let it get a lot of money because it would just be so awful. And they were going for such enormous prices, the dresses before it. Um, and it did, it went for a lot of money, so I was really relieved. And I'm so glad it went to a good home. It was a magical moment. When my dress twirled around on the pavilion, that was the magical moment, and that was my chance, and I was ready to go when that came. I knew what my limit was and how high I could go, which wasn't too high, but I just up, down, up, down, and all of a sudden, I didn't have to put it up anymore, and they said sold to my number. It was probably next to my marriages and my children, I would have to say, one of the most thrilling moments I can ever remember. The morning after, and lot number 26, a fairy tale of a gown designed by the Emanuels, is about to meet its new owner. Fontaine Minor, wife of a wealthy businessman, can't believe her luck. The dress, she says, was a snip at just over $25,000. Whenever the dress is brought out, the dress is under guard because it is that important that we make sure about the preservation and conservation of this dress. So we always have it under guard for any charity event. And today we are so fortunate to have Ray Pulliam be in the guard for the dress. Princess Diana's dress arrived about 
two weeks to a month after the auction, and we were thrilled to have it here, but we had to wait for that special evening to open it. And um, so we were going to open it, and then she died. And life will never be the same, ever. My heart went out to the boys, and my heart went out to all people, to all of us. I mean, to everyone everywhere. What a loss for the entire world. And the tragedy of her death made it so that we didn't want to open the dress anymore because the pain, it was too sad. So finally my daughter called me up one day and said, Mom, I know that you're so sad about the death, but we've got to open the dress because you have agreed to do it for the charity. So I said, you're right. So come over and we'll open it. So we sent our husbands out and we opened it up and the dress came out of the box. And I think from the beginning, I have not believed that this dress is actually mine. I am in awe of the dress and I definitely feel that the dress is 99% Princess Diana's and I am privileged to have it 1% mine. So we got the dress out of the box. I tried it on. It didn't fit because Diana has a beautiful figure. It wouldn't fit me. But my daughter tried it on and she looked absolutely beautiful and she wore the dress that evening. And when she came out, the orchestra played some enchanted evening and people were thrilled. It was, we saved the best for last. In London, Belleville Sassoon have been dressmakers to the royal family for 40 years. Two of the auction dresses were designed by David Sassoon. When I first met the Princess of Wales, she was a very shy, gauche, young Sloan Ranger who was not used at all to buying couture or expensive clothes. So this was a whole new an exciting world for her. And of course her wardrobe changed enormously over the years from the Sloan Ranger to the super sophisticated independent woman of the 90s. Comments on her appearance range from fabulous and stunning to an admiring sight. The princess wearing a magnificent creation of sharpening lace and chiffon. The princess in blue silk by a Japanese designer with a sapphire and diamond the princess chose a Spanish style dress for the occasion. A lot of people seem to think that the princess was in fact obsessed by clothes. That absolutely isn't true at all. She really didn't take clothes all that seriously. She quite enjoyed the fun of choosing an outfit. We would send the princess sketches to choose from and she would write little notes on them. Here we've, she has written, bright pink one please, this one please. And she would make comments on the sketches right the way through this one says please this one here says please could I have this one without the high collar sometimes she would come in at very short notice and say she literally had to have something to wear for the next day or the following week and would choose something from our ready to wear collection and as she was a perfect size perfect size 10, we had no trouble at all in finding something to fit her. And the one that she particularly enjoyed wearing was a black sequined top and a straight skirt. She wore this to a film premiere in 1989. And that particular dress was auctioned and bought by Parry Match. And Parry Match used this as a prize in a competition in their magazine. Parry Match magazine paid $44,000 for lot number four and gave it away in a prize draw. It was won by a doctor's receptionist from Brittany, Madame Martine Le Duarec, and her daughter, Selene. J'étais très fière, très très émue de, de la porter ce jour-là pour les photos de Parry Match. Et je n'aurais jamais pu la reporter par la suite. Car euh, venant d'une princesse, pour moi, c'était impossible que je puisse la remettre. 
Les Didiana faisant plus d'un mètre 80, la robe était beaucoup trop grande pour moi. Donc au niveau de la longueur, ils avaient mis des épingles et tout le long, tout le long du dos également pour la mettre à ma taille. When the Durex decided to sell their dress, it went up for auction in Paris alongside costumes once worn by Brigitte Bardot and Gina Lola Brigida. Nous avons décidé de, de la mettre en vente et ce que nous souhaiterions, ce serait qu'un musée éventuellement euh, la prenne, anglais ou étranger, enfin un musée euh, où tout le monde pourrait la, la contempler, disons. Et voilà, donc euh, on va voir ce que ça va donner. Pour nous, la robe devenait une relique. 90 000, 100 000, 110 000, 120, 120 000, 130 000, 140 000. Non, 140 000 francs de notre côté l'enchère. C'est bien vu à 140 000, j'adjuge. 140 000 francs. The bidding didn't reach the Durex reserve price of 150,000 francs, about 16,000 pounds. The dress was bought in by the auction house, and the Durex will now try to sell it in America. Lot number 21, a satin cocktail dress by Victor Edelstein, went to Woodville, Virginia. Mary Ann Hoffman's mother-in-law bought it for $30,000. Mrs. Hoffman and her late husband used to breed Arab stallions. After his death, she found full-size thoroughbreds too much to handle on her own and went in for breeding miniature horses instead. I actually hadn't picked out one particular dress at all. They all looked lovely and I really wasn't sure that I would be purchasing and bidding. Then this one came along and the way this dress is cut, I thought that a lot of people could fit into it. Uh, some of the dresses were so, so tiny that it would take someone extremely thin to wear it. But this dress I felt that could be possibly worn as it is now. I have no problem with her wearing it um, in situations that it can be available to other people to see like we're doing now. I would be very adverse to her putting it on and going to a party. It has a dress inside of a dress, so she didn't have any panty lines or any straps or that showing. It's very heavy, um, and you think of people having custom-made dresses, they go to the fashion shows and you say, well, that doesn't make a difference, you can just go to the store and buy it off the rack. And now, you know, it definitely does make a difference because of the way it must have fit her perfectly. and. Um, if she could sit down and the hems wouldn't come up or if she had to get out of the car. It's pretty comfortable. It's She was 5'10 and I'm barely 5'6 and there's boning up here. So you just have to sit up pretty straight <laughs> else it gets you. The last time anyone wore the Hoffman's dress was at the National Miniature Horse Show in Lexington, Virginia. Marilyn Hoffman's stable manager wore it to present the prizes. It's a tribute to the late Princess of Wales and in honor of her memory, Linda Robinson wears the dress today. And I had written up a tribute to the Princess of Wales, which was read over the loudspeaker during the show. I didn't really know or anticipate what the reaction would be to seeing this dress, and there was total silence and, and then complete applause, and there were grown men standing there with tears in their eyes. Six hundred. Six hundred there. Seven hundred anywhere. New bidder, seven hundred. It's against you. Eight hundred. After seven. the Christie's sale, the princess suggested to Lord Archer that he might like to buy up all the remaining limited edition auction catalogues and sell them for charity. One thousand? One one? We've been averaging about five thousand pounds. And I'm hoping to turn my investment of twenty-seven thousand pounds. I paid for all of them and they cost me twenty-seven thousand. I'd like to turn that 27,000 into 1 million for charity. To anybody 800? 
And it's so Diana, really, who's done it. Six. It's her, them wanting her six. dresses. It's done it. Pounds. If you've been selling items all evening that go to men, chances to see England play Scotland at rugby, an opportunity to fly over and see the world heavyweight title, there's nothing for the women at all. But if you end on the Diana Dresses book, all the men suddenly feel guilty, and the women are desperate to own it, and you can raise a vast amount of money. My record for uh, this particular item, 50,000 pounds. I'm not a philanthropist, and I'm not a wealthy woman. I thought of it as a business plan. Well, the summer of 97, I was planning to make a real estate investment and purchase a couple of houses that needed to be remodeled. So that investment would probably have been around 120 to 130, 40 thousand dollars. So I decided, why not take the same money, make an investment. Uh, showed these dresses for charity and was amazed that the dresses were not as expensive as I expected. I was watching some of them go for less than 20000 and I kept thinking, you can't get a good used car for that. These dresses are one of a kind, worn by the most recognized woman in the world. This dress I definitely was after from the very beginning because I had the, my uh, Girl Scouts in mind and I love green. This particular dress I was very much after because I wanted a Canadian connection because we are a border city here in Port Huron. Uh, the interesting thing about these clothing, uh, about her dresses, and not just Catherine Walker but the other designers, is that they designed the undergarments and the foundations within the dress. So this has an old fashioned like Boussier and or long line as many people refer to and of course that makes every woman look thinner. This is the red spangle dress that I'm known for. Most of my dresses are around 25,000, but the red dress was the most expensive because I bid up to 35. The media came up when I got the dress and overwhelmed me, and I had not been aware of anyone else getting that kind of a response. And it was really only later that evening watching Larry King live that I realized what all the excitement about the red dress was about. And the story behind it is that there was someone in the fashion industry in New York that's a prominent person, and he describes himself as a cross-dresser. And his name is Zandra Fox, and he had bid against me on the red dress. I was unaware of that until I literally saw him on Larry King that night. Today I'm Zondra Fox, drag queen extraordinaire. But the rest of the time I happen to be an art dealer of some ability. What I do is walk around and know a lot about art. I went there because of course it was a fabulous event. And since I always go to fabulous events, and only go to fabulous events, I had to go to this one. Okay. And since they wear some nifty clothes, I figured, well, why not? And it was a dress I actually was thinking about buying if it had gone reasonably. The New York Times described it as a loud, red dance dress. Actually, they actually single this out. It's a red dress with a fitted bodice and fits right over the fanny with like little pup uh, shoulder sleeves and then a, a fit and flare skirt. It's red with kind of a silver plaid and it looked really good. Now, Diane and I are probably one size apart. She's like an eight and I'm maybe a ten. Looking at the catalog, it said, you should be prepared to bid two to three to five thousand dollars. I said, well, I can do that. I'm in the art business and I can spend five thousand bucks, you know, on something like this. If I have the money, I always get it. I said, well, okay, I'm interested in this thing. And, you know, so I said, well, why not? I think if it fit, I would wear it. If it didn't fit, well, I'd put it in the closet. It's like another fabulous collectible. I'm not collecting dresses, but this looked good. Uh, when she started out with Chuck, she was a little more demure, shall we say, because she had like a social position to adhere to. But after she got separated from Chucky, she began to become her own person. And you could see that in her wardrobe as it began to develop. I mean, some of her more interesting clothes did not get auctioned. Her Versace stuff, I don't know if she had any Versace bondage type stuff or any rubber stuff, but you never know, you know, another 10 years, another half dozen boyfriends, maybe a couple more husbands, you know what she was gonna be like. Now, lot two, 60,000 on the left at 60. At 60,000. 
at $60,000, 65,000. Plenty more at 65,000. Here's the bid at $65,000. Are you all down? Last time at $65,000. For you, sir. We didn't realize that after buying this dress, just how much in the public eye we would suddenly become. Well, we're filming here in the Royal Guru Yacht Club because I didn't want you to film inside my house because I didn't want to be targeted by possible criminals. But I do not keep the dress there. It is kept in the bank vault, except when we take it out to charity functions. We decided that uh, it would be a good idea to go to New York and try and get one of the, the dresses in the collection and uh, use that to help to raise uh, money for the smaller charities in Scotland and particularly Scottish charities. I found her the most startling, beautiful woman I have ever met, of course, after my wife. And uh, she came up and uh, I said to Breeze, goodness, she's coming towards us. And uh, with that, she came up and I said to her, the reason why we were there was because we were interested in buying one of the dresses that were going on auction. And she asked uh, me which dress it was. And I said it was number two in the catalogue. Uh, and she said, well, I don't, can't remember which dress that was. So I pointed to her, I said, it's uh, really behind you there. It's the little black dress. Looked at it and turned back to me and said, oh, that dress, that's the dress everybody's interested in. She wore that dress on the night to the Serpentine Galleries when Prince Charles admitted on television to the world that he had committed adultery with Mrs. Camilla Parker Bowles. One day, Dan and her brother walked into my shop and then she told me that she would like something specially to be designed for her. And I knew that I had to design something wonderful for her. Then uh, I haven't seen her wearing it. And I was a bit disappointed because I believed in the design. I thought it was beautiful and she, she needed something, something different in black. Probably she wasn't wearing black so far. Well, one day, almost two years after the time I designed the dress, every newspaper, every magazine that day had Diana in that dress, and it looked wonderful, you know, the way she was in the park, and uh, there was a little bit of breeze, and this little tail was moving around. She looked like a beautiful black bird, and that's how that dress stayed in my mind. This is an exact copy of the dress in a small scale and is there to stay with me. So I want to keep this just for that, for the rest of my life. I remember Diana and her beautiful smile and her beautiful character. My opinion is somewhat colored by the fact that we have several things in common, so I definitely had a feeling of camaraderie or something. First of all, we're both very tall. She was about 5'10", and I'm about 6 feet. We both had two boys, and we both had marriages that fell apart. So that is somewhat of a bonding experience. Looking for a way to rebuild her life after the collapse of her marriage, Barbara Jordan spent part of her divorce settlement on setting up a boutique in Boston she thought she would buy one of Diana's dresses to publicize the new shop. I went to the preview party the night before and decided that I really wanted just one black velvet dress, that this was what I was going to do. And of course, I had nobody had any idea how much they were going to go for. So I had sort of an indeterminate idea. At 80,000 now. Last time. And when they started off with, at the auction, the dresses were sort of 
really expensive. So then when it got down to a point where it was less expensive, I thought, oh my God, what if I can't get my dress? I better get a dress now. Ladies bid, for you, madam. And you get caught up in auction fever. And then this other dress came that seemed like a goodbye. And it's yours. So I bought the second dress. And then, of course, the dress I really wanted was the last one I bought, so I couldn't leave without that one. So all of a sudden, coming in for one, I found myself with three dresses, costing about $100,000. Immediately after her death, the store started getting calls about where were the dresses, because people had read in the paper that I'd bought these dresses. And so I decided that I would put them in the window, and it immediately became a mini shrine for people. And they came and left notes and flowers. And it was a very respectful sort of thing, and people just standing outside looking at the dresses. Barbara Jordan is a well-known Boston philanthropist, and over the next few months, she gave away her three dresses to favorite Boston charities. I gave one of the dresses to the Pine Street Inn for the Homeless, the Women's Division, because I feel that there's a lot of women there coming from all walks of life who envision their life very differently. And I feel very strongly that there's a lot of, but for the grace of God, go I. I picked charities that I felt were grassroots charities that I felt very close to. And I think that Diana would have felt close to these also. Barbara Jordan hoped that giving a Diana dress to the Pine Street Inn would bring it publicity as well as money. In December 1998, Pine Street re-auctioned the dress at Skinner's in Boston. It is 23,000 now, say 24. I have 23,000 on the phone. I happened to be slipping through this auction catalog from Boston and came across two dresses that were originally owned by Princess Diana that were in the original Christie's auction didn't know the date of the auction or when these dresses were coming up. And I just decided that they had had the sale already. I had thought that the sale was over. Called up Skinner Gallery and I wanted to find out what the dresses sold for. And they said, you're joking, right? The dresses are coming up for sale in like 15 minutes. And I said, oh my God, it's, this has to be like fate. So I said to the person on the phone, well, you know, I'd like to bid on at least one of the dresses. The bid is $23,000, it's on the phone. Is there any advance? Last call. And uh, I bought the first one that came up for sale. So 23000 to 959 Richard Mincer usually deals in paintings and Tiffany glass. He bought the original lot number 31 for the same price Barbara Jordan had paid at Christie's two years earlier. With this particular dress, I didn't buy it for any particular reason. I literally bought just on a whim, except that my sister was a big influence because I knew that she loved Princess Diana um, and she collected books and magazines on her and followed everything about her life going all the way back to the time of the wedding. And I kind of thought that it would be really interesting to bid on this. And now, of course, my sister didn't know that I was bidding on it or that I got it. And when I called her on the phone and she said, uh, and I told her about it, she thought the whole thing was a joke. There was no way that this story was true. So then finally, you know, she, uh, I convinced her that uh, I bought it. And she goes, oh my God, you have to just bring this dress over to my house. My sister, unfortunately, is shorter than Princess Diana. So uh, when she tried it on, it was uh, too long for her. But she really wanted to wear something that Princess Diana had once put on or that was made for Princess Diana. and. She loved her for so many years, and just to hold or even touch something that she had uh, at one time meant a lot to her uh, emotionally. So I was very glad that she, I was able to give her that experience. <laughs> How do you make a dress? Strapless dress, most important thing is that it stays up. How does it stay up? It stays up for two reasons. One, because it has a waistband that fits you firmly in the waist. 
and then the bodice is supported by bonings. It also has to fit closely around here. Otherwise, as you've seen lots of ladies do, because the damn thing is falling down. Tight waistband, no falling down. End of story. It's invariably hard work, but it is enormously satisfying. Particularly when you end up with somebody like the Princess of Wales wearing it. One of the two dresses that were in the auction was a navy blue tulle. Tulle is like knit, but very much finer and softer. A strapless, long torso dress, the bodice ended, I suppose, about nine or ten inches below the waist, and then it had a huge, full, flaring skirt coming from that dropped waistline. I had covered the tulle for the bodice in tiny diamante. It was then draped, and then I put stars onto tulle, cut them out, and scattered them over the bodice and the skirt. The hemline of the dress was something in the region of 120, 130 yards. Four or five layers of tulle, each layer successively larger than the one beneath it, and each layer edged with very fine horsehair. Quite a lot of work, but worth it. Murray Arbeet's blue dress, lot number 28, went to Memphis, Tennessee. It was bought for $48,000 by America's top bridal designer, Pat Kerr. So this is the dress that um, is the first one, actually, that I purchased. And it is by Murray Arbid. And I think it's really beautiful. It's um, very representative to me of the 80s and uh, London in the 80s. And she loved dancing. And it has the diamantes with the stars and the tulle. And uh, she was a star. Pat Kerr paid a total of $133,000 for four dresses to add to her collection of royal memorabilia. This is one of Queen Victoria's night gowns. I have a, a really large collection of her things. I'm a real fan of Queen Victoria. And this, of course, has her, her crest and her monogram on it and beautiful Valenciennes lace. And it's just handkerchief soft. It's lovely. And this is a pair of her hand-woven silk stockings. To a collector, Authenticity is everything. Pat Kerr was surprised to hear that a dress purporting to be Lot 28 was drawing crowds to a museum in North Carolina. Thousands had paid to see what they believed was Diana's dress. This is the uh, catalog uh, in which the dress was displayed. It's as if it were the original. It has all of the information that was out of the Christie's catalog. The museum catalog lists the dress owners as Mr. Jean London and Mr. John Thomas, New York dealers in theatrical costumes and second-hand celebrity clothes. They didn't want to be interviewed, but claimed the dress was sold onto them by the original Christie's buyer, someone other than Pat Kerr, whose name they won't reveal. So does Pat Kerr really have Diana's dress? Well, I can assure you I do. <laughs> I've purchased this, and here's the, uh, the tag on it, still from Christie's. It's never been out of my... Um, possession since I purchased it along with the other three that I purchased on that same day and um, it's definitely the authentic one. Do, does it matter in any sense that someone else might be saying that they have this dress? Well it only matters to the way that he will respond to my lawyer. That dress, that navy blue tulle evening dress, was a very very successful dress in the collection and there are certainly more than one of them I would like to say many more. There are possibly, I don't know, 15, 20 of them still floating around. If they are still floating around, it was a very good evening dress. And after all, the princess never ever said, oh, this has got to be the only one and you mustn't make it for anybody else. Simple as that. In London's West End on his way to work, 
Murray Arbeet was surprised to come across what looked like another of his dresses sold at Christie's as lot number 44 for $25,000. Diana wore this dress to a film premiere in 1987 and again in Spain. Now it was on display in the foyer of a glamour photography business called Cover Shots International. Hi Joe, my name's Rupert, I'm going to be your makeup artist today. Okay, how are you feeling? Feeling all right? Yeah. A little bit nervous? Yeah? Yeah, I've got anything to worry about. Just put your head back with me. That's great. Close your eyes. At the time, it was a very commercial decision indeed. It's become sentimental since then, obviously. But uh, it was a very hard-headed decision at the time. Uh, we are portrait photographers. We, we photograph uh, women. They come to the studio and we make them look very beautiful. And the concept of, of possessing a, a, a dress that had been worn by Diana and possibly running a prize draw with the opportunity of being photographed in that dress was a very, very appealing idea to us. Switch around just a bit more. We received our dress a few weeks later, and we were planning to do something a little later in the year. And then, of course, the tragedy happened. And at that point, um, it became a completely different issue as to what we did with the dress. Frankly, it would have been uh, not only inappropriate in, in, in terms of good taste, but the, the dress became so valuable, I was absolutely staggered. The original dress is, is on loan uh, to Althrop House. And so what we have is a copy of the address. And the joy of that is that we, we're then able to do this in each of our four branches. So we have a display like this in London and in Birmingham and in Manchester and in the Glasgow branch as well. Twist your body to the right. Good. Yeah, just smile that. Turn around towards the actual uh, camera itself now. Dropping a hand down, pulling the coat onto your waist. Good. Side swallow if you can. We paid 90000 for this dress and had um, a okay from um, our chief financial officer to go up to about 250000 So we think we got a bargain. <laughs> New York-based cable TV channel Romance Classics took their three dresses on a publicity tour around the shopping malls of America. Unfortunately, we had a tagline that was called... Um, you know, Princess Dies Tour, Dresses to Die For. And obviously, um, that got stopped in the middle of the night when we found out that she uh, passed away. Um, we had called security at the mall, pulled the dresses. There was a big semi-truck that was traveling and touring these dresses that had the big logo, Romance Classics logo on it, and a dress to die for, and uh, pulled that into a garage and had that repainted and uh, pulled all the advertising and retooled the tour to a Legacy of Love. The Legacy of Love tour gave people a chance to see the dresses and record their feelings about Diana. There's a place in my heart where I keep God and Diana is right there because she was such an inspiring woman and so dedicated to children and to just the good of humanity. She's just unreal. People want to talk about it in the mourning process. They wanted to get on tape and explain what Princess Di meant to them. And it was really heartfelt and, and quite warming for us. Before I joined the Air Force, I was not even, I didn't want to do anything. I, whatever I did, I cannot do it. But once I said, look, if she can do that, I can do this. And when, at the end of all this, I joined the military and I came out of the Air Force with honors. When you work in a very serious field like cancer, and my husband is also a, uh, an oncologist, we need to totally get away from what we do in our professional life. It's nice to be able, when you come home, to step away from some of the sadness, if you will, that we experience in our day-to-day -day professional lives. 
Well, I think that when people come to my house who aren't aware of my Diana collection and they see the doll room, if you will, for the first time, they might think I'm a little bit eccentric. But at my age, I can handle that. Professor Sana couldn't afford to buy a $20,000 dress on her own, but her sister Roberta paid half, and they ended up with lot 67. I've always uh, admired and appreciated Diana, but I wouldn't have classified myself as a real fan. Quite contrary to my sister who has collected Diana memorabilia from the beginning. I knew that having one of her dresses would be a dream come true for Linda and I wanted to participate in that dream with her. So you can't believe how excited we were when we had the conversation, figured out a prize, and then we're lucky enough to, in fact, have the dress that was my favorite <laughs> be the one that we ended up owning. I mean, what a wonderful dream to have come true. And these two sisters were astonished to find that 20,000 bid secured a Bruce Oldfield gown. We're gonna share it. And we're gonna have fun, with it. have fun with it. We'll certainly try it on. We have two other sisters. Uh, we may, may not wear it out, we might wear it in for some in, in, <laughs> informal parties. As soon as we got the dress in our hotel room, we could not resist trying it on. I mean, that is as close as to Diana as we would ever be. I have to say, this is a very elegant dress, independent of uh, Diana, that it is a heavily beaded dress, that the silk uh, feels marvelous, that it hangs beautifully on the body, that one could feel like a princess regardless of who owned it. It is really a very beautiful dress. I felt pretty wonderful in it, and I'm going to imagine that so did Diana. Lot number 79 was the one everyone wanted to see. The so-called John Travolta dress fetched a record $200,000. It went to Tampa, Florida, along with 13 other dresses, all bought by the same successful businesswoman, Maureen Rorick. I had taken a look at several portfolios of my investments, and uh, there was one in particular that I felt had basically peaked, and so I knew that I was looking for an investment vehicle that would grow the money at a certain rate, and felt that those would be increasing in value over time and then worked with my banker to make arrangements very quietly with Christie's that I would uh, stay home and see if I couldn't be successful in participating in the sale. So just basically participated over the phone. 90,000, 95,000, 100,000. I was looking to collect 12 dresses that really visually represented the princess's style transformation from the early 80s right up and through the mid-90s. So I had a matrix. I actually had a chart, and I had the years going down uh, the side, and I had different um, design elements going across the top, you know, light, dark, short, long, sequin, velvet, what have you. And I was looking to check in as many boxes as I could. 140,000. Typically in the twenty-five to forty thousand dollar range. Of course, there were a few that were much higher than that, uh, like the John Travolta dress. I knew she was going to say that. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Last time, yours, Francis, for two hundred thousand dollars. I received a call at three o'clock in the morning from my mother and it was the, the night uh, that the princess was killed and she said uh, the, the road you take with those dresses has, has changed and you need to be very very responsible with what you have and you know I don't mean to put the burden on your shoulder but you need to really rethink the entire experience and I, I said yeah I know that it's been going through my mind and really in talking with uh, friends over the next few days and viewing uh, much of the, the footage that was on the news about uh, people's uh, grief uh, globally, we, uh, we uh, myself and, and a few very close friends, came up with the idea to tour the dresses and share them with the public, and in doing so, to, to raise money for charity. When, of course, the auction happened, we really didn't know what would happen afterward. 
obviously who does. Um, but what we're looking at here, I suspect, is the whole notion of saints and relics. This is a rather medieval notion, of course, and relics have pretty much been phased out by the Catholic Church. But Diana has become, for better or worse, some sort of secular saint. In the past, when a church had the relics of a saint, they used it for the purposes of bringing in revenues. Some of the people who purchased dresses at the auction are in fact using them to raise funds for charitable purposes, which is exactly what saints' relics were used for in the Middle Ages. So Diana has the iconography of a saint in having relics. She also has the iconography of a saint having mar being martyred, in a sense. Now, no one actually took her out and tortured her for her beliefs, certainly not. But martyrdom doesn't always have to be this kind of direct kind of thing. You can die for not necessarily just what you believe, but also just for who you are. Young women make the best martyrs. I mean, in Baroque painting, for example, there are always young women being stripped to their birthday suit and being horribly tortured by these evil-looking characters who may be construed today as the paparazzi pursuing and torturing Diana. It's roughly the same sort of predatory, persecutory relationship, you see. In the Middle Ages, relics were usually put in jeweled gold, silver reliquaries that could be displayed. Now, I don't know if anyone who's made a, you know, a jeweled glass vitrine for Diana's dresses, but I bet there are a few. Half the dresses sold at the Christie's auction went to anonymous buyers, and who knows if they'll ever be seen again. Meanwhile, wherever Diana's dresses are put on display, people queue to see them, examine them, and wonder about the life and tragic death of the princess who once wore them. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country because I do things differently, because I don't go by a rule book, because I lead from the heart, not the head. And albeit that's got me into trouble in my work, I understand that. But someone's got to go out there and love people and show it. The highest royal in my mind, the one that has attained the greatest heights, the most beautiful, the top royal, the royal that reached out to all people, and no one will ever top her is Diana. She is the ultimate royal. <laughs> 